There you go. Hello, Bye. everyone, and welcome to our Binge Books Book Club chat. I am Alessandra Tori, and I'm joined today by Dean Koontz, who is going to be talking to us about his newest release and everything books. So welcome so much, Dean. It's fantastic to have you here. Well, thank you for having me there. We have live viewers that are joining us from Facebook and YouTube, and we already have a ton of questions coming in. But before we dive into those, do you want to, and I know, I know this is a hard question to ask, especially with this book, but do you want to give just an elevator or if someone's joining us and they haven't read The Big Dark Sky, um, do, you, do you think you can describe it in a few sentences? Uh, uh, it may take me a little more, but first I'd rather say also, for all those live visitors uh, putting questions, if any dead ones come in, let's put them to the front of the line. Thank I love that machine. idea. We'll, we'll yeah. pop them up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Big Dark Sky is, uh, this is a book I've wanted to write for 40 years, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. It's about synchronicity, those enormous coincidences in life which I've been collecting uh, from all over the world for most of the last four decades. And I couldn't figure out how to write a novel about synchronicity, even though uh, uh, Carl Jung, uh, Jung said, uh, synchronicity or incredible coincidences aren't coincidences at all. They're evidence of how the structure of the universe is. And then quantum mechanics came along and said the same thing. And finally, I one day after 40 years, I'm a little slow, uh, thought, ah, I, this story re revolves around one I've been also trying to write, which would be about a woman who was raised on an isolated ranch. And it was uh, like an Eden in Montana until she was nine. And she then some tragedy occurred and she went to live with her aunt in New Mexico. And 25 years later, she gets a message from a secret friend or something like a secret friend that she doesn't even remember having. And the secret friend says, come back. I need you. I'm in a dark place. And she goes back. But what she's going back to isn't anything she imagined. That was another story I never could figure out. Where does it go? And then suddenly, a year, year and a half ago or whenever, these two stories about synchronicity and that story married, and it became this multi-character epic sort of novel condensed into 100,000 words that is The Big Dark Sky. And it's hard to talk about it too much without giving away twists and turns because there are a lot of them. But I had great fun writing it, so I hope it translates into great fun reading it. I think it it absolutely does. And there is such an incredible cast of characters with this book. And you you just did a great job of of giving enough without giving away everything. Um, so I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions about that. I want to jump into one from Gigi DeLuca. Um, she's thrilled to meet you. She started reading your books in the 80s. And you're her favorite author. She would like to know what comes first, the plot or the characters and why? They are almost simultaneous. Uh, the characters probably a nanosecond or two after the plot premise. Uh, I don't write outlines. Uh, so as a consequence, I start with the story idea. I have no idea where it's going. Once in a great while, I know where the end has to be, but generally not. And when I get the idea, the sort of premise, then I have the very next thing, because I think characters are the essence of good fiction. Uh, you have to love the characters. Uh, you don't have to want to be like them. You don't have to love them because they're admirable. The good ones, you want them to love them because they're admirable, but you kind of have to have a dark sort of love also for the bad ones in the sense that you want to know what they're going to do next. You have to love wanting to read about them. So my next step is who is the character that carries that plot the best? Or maybe one or two characters. And who is the antagonist, the bad guy who's gonna be the nemesis for this character throughout? Those don't necessarily come together. Usually I start with the character you want to identify with, the one you're going to admire or like. Uh, and I think about that, but I don't think too much. I don't do, I don't do uh, character traits. I don't do pages of 
uh, what do they look like or what do they think or what is their past, get a little sense of who they are as a person and what is the unique thing about their psyche, uh, what sort of thing underlying it uh, drives them. In the case of, the, and this is an unusual novel because there's a, a larger cast, but in case of the female lead, she's a person whose life is built on tragedy. Uh, and uh, uh, that really matters as we get into the story because as she finds out the tragedies she has dealt with as a child of nine are not what she thought they were. The cause of them is not what she thought they were. And those tragedies have led her to have a right life as a writer and have certain attitudes, but suddenly it's all built on sand. So that makes that character interesting for me. And then I want to know how she works and how she thinks. And that's the sort of way I begin. Fantastic. And talking about characters and storytelling and with this story, you paint such vivid scenes and you, for a thriller writer, I, I guess, um, and we'll, and I'd like to go into genre in a minute, but for um, for the genre that you write in, you do use more descriptions than a lot, and but you're also packing so much action and so many different things happening in those scenes. Do you think a lot about, do you have to trim description or add description in, or does it just naturally flow out of you in the amount that we're seeing as the finished product? I, ha I have this sort of philosophy of fiction that, Good fiction gives you multiple things. It gives you good characters, gives you a story that plunges forward. I, I always think that uh, the pace has to be, in, for me, just keep you on the edge of your seat sort of pace. At the same time, that doesn't mean that you don't need to portray the scene properly. I really believe that it's our obligation to show the culture the character lives in to show the natural world the character lives in. And, you know, one of the biggest things I get from readers over all these years is your books are like movies to me. I can see everything that happens. Well, that grows because I don't shortchange description of scenes and stuff. Now, you have to be careful. You don't go on for a page about something. It's about finding that metaphor, that simile, that that figure of speech that really conveys something very vividly. Uh, once in a great while, I get a letter from somebody who said, why do you have to tell me what the weather is? Why do you have to tell me what the scenery is? Well, because that's part of what forms us all. We're formed by the natural world we live in. We're formed by the culture we live in. And if it's not in there, I don't feel personally as a reader, that I'm getting the whole story. Uh, yeah, I could I could trim it way down to just what happens, but then I don't think it matters so much. Uh, I think it matters because I have this little rule not to go on at great length. If I'm gonna tell you uh, two lines about the sky or about the background in which the character is standing, then that has to serve at minimum three functions. It has to create a mood that fits the scene. It has to say something about the character or the theme of the novel. And it also has to do something to further the plot. Uh, and that might seem impossible, but it isn't if you really love the English language and you make the effort to do those things. If you do, then everything flows in a way. You know, I get a lot of mail also that has always surprised me. I've gotten literally thousands of letters from dyslexic people who have said, I've never been able to read for pleasure because it's so hard for me to track the language until I found your novels and I could read them without effort. And after reading 20 or 30 of them, I can read other people without much effort. And I've always found that fascinating. And I think it's because of what I do. It's the struggle with the language to make it as smooth and sleek as you can possibly make it. And that does not make mean making it short and brief. It means polishing all of those descriptions until they're as easy to read as you can make them. 
And then someone dyslexic can suddenly make sense of the language. I find that fascinating and something I've been trying to understand in some kind of philosophical level, but I'm not that philosophical, so I haven't understood it. Well, we have a lot of comments um, in the box, a lot of which say that they discovered you with Odd Thomas or, you know, um, a lot of just love for Odd Thomas that, that's showing up here. Um, and I know at one point you said like, oh, I'll never write a sequel, but then obviously you have written a few series. <laughs> did you know with Odd Thomas that that was gonna be a series from the beginning? And did you realize that that was gonna be such a special book that would connect with so many readers? Was there a time where you thought, hey, like I really have something with this, I'm not ready to leave this world? Yeah, the, uh, for Odd Thomas, I, was, I had always said, publicly over and over again, which shows what an idiot I am. You never make these declarations in public uh, that I would never write a series. And then this character overwhelmed me. Uh, I said a few minutes ago, character for me is everything in fiction. And this character just came alive so quickly and so endearingly that I was about halfway through the book and I thought, well, this is going to be a series. And I also very quickly understood what the series essence, in essence was about. It was about a character who, as humble as he is and as sweet as he is, was on the way to a, a st story that would carry him over a number of volumes into a condition of absolute humility, which I've never experienced personally. Uh, so I didn't know how I'd write about that, but I was so intrigued about how I would do that. And when I delivered the novel, I've talked about this sometimes before, not that this reflects terribly on the publisher. He just came from a different ethos than mine and he hated the book. He couldn't understand this character. This is not the hero of a thriller. This is, is not the kind of, this is a guy who needs a weapon. He picks up a broom. Uh, he tries to deal with things in a less, uh, Jack Reacher kind of way, or in less of a James Bond kind of way. And he didn't like that. And he liked, disliked it so much, he wouldn't talk to me about the book. Uh, and as a consequence, I was in a problematic place because I knew I wanted to write more about this character. Then what happened was the book went out in advance to reviewers and to book buyers, booksellers, uh, people who uh, decide what they're going to order. And they all loved it. Uh, I think we had 120 reviews and two bad ones. Uh, and so the publisher then said to me, okay, you want to write more about this character? You can do That's so. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Between each book, you got to write a standalone, which is what I did. So, yeah. And then I ended up writing a couple more series. But, uh, but it all is, does the character move you to that extent? I love that. And this might be an easy question to answer because the answer might be odd Thomas, but Dawn from Facebook says, I know this is like asking what is your favorite child or fur baby, but do you have a favorite standout character or book? You know, there's all kinds of characters I love as if they were real people in my life. Uh, odd Thomas is one. Jane Hawk is another. Uh, there is a wonderful girl in, uh, uh, one Door Away from Heaven, uh, Leilani uh, Klonk is her last name, Leilani Klonk, and uh, she stays in my mind like she's a real person, as do a number of characters in that book. Uh, as anyone who works with us will testify, if they go by in my office, I'm sometimes sitting there and alone laughing out loud. Other times I can be in tears. Uh, because of what's happening in the story. And that only happens if the characters seem to me as real as real people I've known. I love that. Absolutely. Um, and talking about your process or, you know, your your career, um, was there a point where you really felt that you had found, I mean, I know for all of us, you're very famous, but was there a moment in your career where you're like, I made it, this, this is it. Can you tell us about kind of that, your first book where you really felt like you had security in a career and you could write forever. Did that, did that ever happen at a certain time? It actually never happened. <laughs> I've, I've always been filled with self-doubt and I've had 
I've had to change editors and publishers over the years because all of them had doubt about what I was delivering to them at some point because uh, publishers often want exactly what you've done before. And I don't do that. And so it always leads to kind of problems. Uh, also, you have to know, I came from a dirt poor family with a violent alcoholic father. So self-doubt is built into me from my earliest years. Uh, and so every time I start a book, it's like, it's high excitement. And then somewhere within 40 or 50 pages, it's like, what the hell am I doing? And uh, that never goes away until the book is done and somebody else reads it. Uh, first, my wife, who is my toughest and fairest critic. And if she thinks, okay, you can send this in, then I'm pretty sure I can send it in. So I wish I had been at some point very full of myself and utterly certain that everything was great that was coming out of the typewriter. But uh, it's only in retrospect. It usually takes me a few years to look back on a book and say, hey, that actually kind of worked. Uh, so... Well, you just made a lot of authors days because I think so many of us do that same moment where we hate the book and think it's horrible. Um, so it's nice to know that even someone with as many books under their belt as you can go through that same roller coaster. Um, Carrie says, or yeah, how do you come up with your characters' names? That's interesting. That's a good question if I've ever been asked that before. Uh, a lot of times they have serious meaning, and so they're chosen to support what's going on under the surface of the story. Um, yeah, and other times they just come to me, and Ob Thomas just came to me. It wasn't any significant meaning to it. Uh, I wrote a novel in which it was one of the Ob Thomas novels, in which every uh, bad guy's and good guy's name other than odds that in people odd had dealt with in other books, was actually uh, a word in, uh, in Hebrew. And I thought no one would ever identify that until the, uh, the Israeli edition of the book came out. And I started getting all these letters saying, do you know that these characters' names are words in Hebrew? And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if I had like 12 characters whose names were actually Hebrew words? And that never dawned on me. Uh, that would have been quite a bit of synchronicity to go back to that. So, yeah, I, I choose names sometimes. I've put a lot of effort into it uh, because I, I want the name to stick with you uh, no matter who it is. Uh, but sometimes it means more than that. And there's a whole, probably a whole essay in what, why sometimes it means more than that. That's fantastic. Um, Teresa said, I loved your book, A Big Little Life. Do you still have dogs? I know the answer to this, but um, you want to answer that? Yes, there's a, a, a large golden retriever in the room right now, who at any moment will probably parade back and forth behind us. She gets sometimes in these interviews to think, what about me? And she goes past with her tail up in the air as background. But uh, yeah, uh, we didn't have dogs in our lives until about 30 years ago or so. And now I can't even imagine why, because a dog makes life so much better uh, and so much more amusing and so much full, more full of love uh, that it's, it's almost a sin not to have a dog. So, uh, so right now we have Elsa, who when I was doing a snail mail newsletter was the star of it she'd have her picture throughout of it and people would write and say, less of you, more of Elsa. Uh, and I totally understand that. I love that. And I saw a bunch of references to Trixie. Is Trixie a dog? Trixie was our first dog. I wrote a book about her called The Big Little Life. Oh, that's what it was. And then after Trixie came Anna and now Elsa. And the only terrible things about dogs is how short their lives are and how horrible it is to have to put one down. The hardest thing in life for me. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's, it's the way it is. And it's, it's almost in a way of the way of being reminded that we don't live forever either. It does. And one line in this book said that some people believe that dogs have a, a psychic sense. Um, was that coming from a certain place? Do you think dogs have a psychic sense? 
I do know that dogs are smarter than we give them credit for. Uh, the woman who founded the assistance dog thing, aside from the blind, uh, Bonnie Bergen, uh, who founded the first Canine Companions for Independence, which my wife and I have supported for 30 years now, uh, uh, she wrote a book called Teach Your Dog to Read. And she realized one day dogs were so clever that if you taught them all these things they could learn, like 50, 60 different uh, tasks that they can learn, which they have to learn as an assistance dog, that she could also put the words for these on flashcards and teach the dog to recognize the word on a flashcard. And she did. She'd hold up the word sit and the dog would sit. Uh, so she taught her dogs to read. Uh, now, that is strange in its own right, but I have had numerous experiences with our dogs that tell me there is a psychic connection that dogs see and hear things while well, we know they smell things we don't. Their smell sense of smell is thousands of times greater than ours, but I am sure they see things we don't, and, uh, and, and that's where their sort of reputation for having sort of psychic ability comes. Uh, and, uh, and I've had many examples of it. If I were right, I wrote about that a little bit in the, do in the book I wrote about Trixie, A Big Little Life. Uh, but if I were to write another book, having had two more of these beautiful animals, uh, I would have other examples to write about. Our next question comes from Jennifer. She says, um, it's been a pleasure to read your work. She's curious, have you ever had a moment of synchronicity in your own life that stood out or one that you'd like to share from all your research? That is the other thing. The more I studied synchronicities, I got intrigued of them just because it was interesting, like strange disappearances or UFOs or any of the rest of all the oddities in life. And then I began to realize as a number of years ago that life is like this, actually, that we kind of don't register it because we think of one coincidence as just a coincidence and we don't connect it to the chain of things that had to happen to bring that in front of us. One of my favorites is my wife and I went to a high school with 1,200 students. We were in a small town of 4,000 people, but children came from all over the county to go to that high school. So it was an enormous school. Uh, and she was president of her class, and I was class clown of my class. I was one year ahead of her. Uh, and I had never seen her in the hallways. I was a senior. She was a junior. And one day I was in a car with my friend whose father was the town banker. So they had two cars. My father was the town drunk. So we were lucky to have one car. And we were in his car cruising. We came to a stop sign, stoplight. And there was this girl standing on the corner and it was my, my future wife. And I said to him, oh, who is that? Because in this large school, I'd never seen her. And he said, oh, you want nothing to do with her. She's uh, the wife of the town, or she's the daughter of the town shoemaker. And I said to him, what does that mean? I'm the son of the town drunk. <laughs> she's a giant step up for me. Uh, if we hadn't been on that corner at that moment, I had never seen her, though we had been in school all these years together. We were in just one class apart, but never our paths crossed. Then that happened. And, and subsequent to that, there were a series of coincidences that brought us together that, in my mind, amounts to a synchronicity. Uh, so, yeah, the fundamental best thing that ever happened to me in life happened through a series of coincidences. I, I think that's the best example that I could imagine. Um, and speaking of your wife, um, you and her work very closely together, is, is my understanding. Um, and I love that you're able to do that and, and maintain a happy, you know, a happy environment. Um, but can you tell me about how, how y'all work together and what she handles in the business versus you and how she helps with your creative and business processes? Well, her background is accounting. Uh, <laughs> and I couldn't balance a checkbook if my life depended on it. Uh, so we're, that kind of differentiation of our talents is kind of crucial to this. So she takes care of anything dealing with money. Uh, she oversees all of that, which frees me up 
to do all of this stuff I do on the creative end. Uh, and yet we have this shared interest that uh, uh, she was a heavy reader before she ever met me. I was a heavy reader before I met her and we remained heavy readers afterward. So we shared that. We also so shared the same sense of humor, which has a large element of absurdity in it because life is often absurd. Uh, so we share those things. Uh, and I'm this person who looks at, I meet somebody and I say, wow, what an amazing, wonderful human being that is. And Jura will say, I kind of like that person, but there's something wrong. She's always right about that. So that's another interesting thing. Uh, and she's saved me from all kind of relationships that would have been terrible for us in terms of, uh, uh, we've sometimes lament, you'll sometimes meet a wonderful person who's married to an awful person. And you have to give up the wonderful person in order uh, not to have a relationship with the awful person. So, and the way we work together is she, that division of things. And then because she's been such a heavy reader all her life, I trust her to read a novel of mine in manuscript and give me very good feedback. Now, when I was younger and male pride being what it is, she would say, I think this is good, but this and this have to be changed. And I would say, no, you're wrong. You just don't understand the deeper literary meaning of what I'm doing. And then I'd find myself in my office making the changes. <laughs> so it took me a while to grow up and say, you know, she, she sometimes and quite often hits the point because she's, she's very much a realist and she'll identify those things that she feels, okay, you need to address this. I don't think this character would do it. So I've learned just to go away and address it, not make an issue of it. That's fantastic. Um, Natalie asks, is Edgar Allan Poe one of your favorite authors? He's one of mine. The two of you are my favorites. And I love seeing references to Poe in your books. Your language, the vividness reminds me of him. Well, uh, Poe with me, I, I love Poe for a long time. I would say as, a, as a, an older adult or a vastly older adult as I am now, uh, I love Poe's poetry. Uh, I'm, I'm big on poetry. I, I have a large collection of poets and uh, there's some that just resonate endlessly with you. Poe is one of those, T.S. Eliot is one of those. Um, and uh, they older I get, the less the fiction, but I still admire it deeply. So I'm always uh, referencing him in crew, uh, key moments in the book. <coughs> Um, Mary Marina says, um, how many drafts did you go through for the big dark sky? It looks so polished. Uh, well, it's the way I work. I, uh, we talked about that self-doubt issue. Uh, I have it every page of the novel. So when I start the first page, I can't get to the second page until I've got the language in that page. There may be things in story that need change later, but the language has to be as polished as I can get it. So that'll be 10, 20, 30 drafts before I get to page two. Then the South Doubt comes back and page two is the same number of drafts. Then at the end of a chapter, I print it out because what you see on the page is different than what you see in the screen. And I pencil it a couple of different times and enter that. Um, and by the time I get to the end of the novel, it's had so many drafts in progress that I never go back again, except if there's an editorial suggestions and I think, hmm, that's good, that makes sense, let me deal with that. Uh, so I don't do one draft and go through and go back and do another. The drafts are all done in progress. And we are um, just about out of time, but we have a couple of questions hopefully we can get to quickly. Um, Someone said, I love Jane Hawk and devoured all five books. Will we ever see her again? Uh, I don't think so, but it would all depend. There, we have a, uh, a TV series in development uh, based on the Jane Hawk books. And I have seen the first script by the uh, writer, showrunner, producer, 
uh, involved and it was fabulous. And I don't say that lightly. Mostly the scripts that I get based on my stuff make me want to throw up. But this, uh, this script uh, just dazzled me. So I'm hopeful. And if Jane went on another medium, I might think of going back there because I like Jane almost as much as I like Odd Thomas. Uh, she was a, she had a, so tough and yet such a huge heart uh, that I sort of fell in love with her. And then um, a lot of people are asking if there's a place that they can get signed copies of books. Do you have a store? Do you know if there's a retailer that does signed copies? Is there, what is their best chance of ever getting a signed copy? Well, I, uh, COVID sort of put an end to signings and uh, I tend to not go out on signings anymore. But uh, the, there's a bookstore called Poison Pen in Scottsdale. Uh, and uh, that's owned by a woman named Barbara Peters. And I always sign books for Barbara. Uh, and uh, we've been doing this for years. So if you looked up Poison Pen in Arizona in Scottsdale, uh, you might be able to obtain signed copies from there. And Barbara knows that if she runs out of them, I'll always sign more for them. Uh, there are some other stores, but I'm not sure I could make that claim on their behalf, so I'll stay silent. Fabulous. And um, Dean was kind enough to offer some um, signed copies as prizes, so I do want to announce our lucky winners. Um, congratulations to Karina G. from the UK, Martin B. from Canada, and Valerie from the United States. So um, if one of those sounds like you, check your email because our team will be sending you an email to get your, um, your mailing address and congratulations. And, um, and thank you, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but thank you for the fantastic questions that were submitted and for everyone who joined us live or dead. And, uh, and thank you, Dean, for being here. It was fantastic. And if anyone hasn't read this book yet, it's available on Amazon. Uh, the audio is also in paperback, or I'm sorry, not paperback, but hardcover is also on Amazon as well. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you.